I'm Kylie Merritt. Welcome to the ASX Small Cap Virtual Showcase. I'm here with keynote speaker June Bailu from Tribeca. June, great to have you with us. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and of course about the fund. Of course. Well, th thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to always be here. Now, um, my name is Jun Bei Lu. I'm the Lead Portfolio Manager at Tribeca Investment Partners. Uh, my fund is called the Tribeca Alpha Plus. Um, it's been running for over 14 years um, and uh, currently managed just over $750 million. It's a longshore fund, so it's very active. We chase after mm -hmm. where the return is. Um, now, uh, in terms of myself, um, you know, I actually came to Australia um, when I was 16. I brought originally from China. So do excuse me that um, if I make any grammatical errors. <laughs> so, but uh, look, you know, we're passionate, um, I try back, we're passionate about investing. Um, you know, I myself has been investing for over 18 years um, and uh, across Australian equities, um, you know, Asian equities um, for some time I spent time to. And of course, we regularly travel around the world to talk to the companies, talk to the competitors and the regulators. Um, not this year, it's a little bit difficult, yeah. but we do a lot of Zoom as many people people would do. So um, yeah, so that's us. Okay, I want to uh, delve a lot deeper into your strategy. You know, you said you, you're long short. Um, I want to look at all those opportunities, etc. But I do just want to get, you know, take a step backwards and just get your view on markets at the moment. Um, we've seen, you know, the biggest disruption to global economies probably that any of us have lived through. And yet global markets seem to not just be looking through some of that, but looking well beyond. Um, and, and many say kind of, you know, into bubble territory. What do you make of what's going on? That's a really good question. Um, look, I think there are lots of angles to uh, and perspective you can take in the current market, but what's really is is that at the moment there's so much opportunity investment opportunity we can see look there are certain sectors that have performed very well they become very expensive that's probably where a lot of spectators are talking about the bubble territory but do remember they've the, their valuations gone higher is because money is very cheap around the world um, and hence why all asset prices will be rising because there's more money chasing after very rare growth opportunities so they should be higher now on the other side um, where you know the Companies' earnings being impacted significantly by the lockdown and which um, caused by pandemic, of course, they're going to look expensive. A lot of the er companies' earnings have collapsed. Look at the travel, look at airline, look at the shopping centers, um, you know, gaming floors. Um, these businesses, um, in my view, will experience some of these, the premium ones, will experience a V shaped recovery once we move truly beyond um, the lockdown and the virus impact. And some of those businesses, such as Sydney airport, the premium airport assets, um, the premium private hospital assets such as Ramsey. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an incredible amount of opportunity. Once in a decade buying opportunity still mm. exists in those sectors. And what about the timing of that? Because, you know, you, you can imagine that the valuations, you know, at the moment are taking into account that, yes, travel will recover. Yes, um, you know, private hospital operations will recover. But nobody really knows when and, mm. and nobody knows how quickly. Mm, absolutely. Look, the easiest thing for investors to do is to take a longer term view um, because uh, short term sentiment can move and swing with the moods of the investors globally. And this is what represents opportunity for the equity markets because it's liquid and it creates buying opportunities. Take a six, 12 month view and you know those assets. So let's take a private hospital, for example. The volume will return because the minute we saw the lockdown was lifted, um, aside from Victoria, every other state, we saw that um, you know the, uh, the volume picked up significantly uh, in the private hospital. And it's already pre-COVID level um, numbers and above. And, and of course, the Victoria lockdown might take a little bit longer, but we know it should take the same shape of recovery as other states. Uh, and we're already hearing the backlog is about 18 months mm. to clear. So on all these bases, you know share price will come back when the earning returns. Um, and your opportunities currently, because you know many investors can't take the short term or can't take the long term view, um, hence why the share price is where it is right now. Um, shopping centers is the same thing. We're seeing recovery when things improve in different states. Um, and um, and then you know take a longer term view in 12 to in 12 months. We should say see uh, people returning to the shops. Um, if you're anything like me, I. I I'm dying to get out, <laughs> <laughs> dying to travel. But look, travel is slightly different. It's a yeah. little bit far away. Um, but buying an asset like Sydney Airport, you know, downside is very limited. Yeah. So what about your strategy? Um, you know, you are a long short fund, very active. 
has it had to change during this sort of COVID period during the last six months or is it just the same as it's always been just with more opportunities at both ends? I think it's the same as it's always been a lot of opportunities. I actually find this um, it's during times of um, extreme volatility that strategy like mine actually shows its benefits because um, we are seeing so many opportunities. But like you said, near-term earning might not be there mm-hmm. and they, they will go up 10%, go down 20%. So how do you manage that risk? So with the ability to short, I can go after every opportunity I see, um, let it be in the buy now, pay later sector or whether it's in the casino space, I can buy them because I can short other things to um, offset set the volatility of my portfolio. Hence why we managed to deliver the return through this cycle on the up month and on the down month, because we can go after the opportunity and ultimately they will deliver the return. It's the company itself um, that will generate the earnings and better expectations from investors. Okay. So in terms of, um, I guess, sectors where you're looking for growth, you've mentioned health, you've mentioned travel, buy now, pay later. Um, Anywhere else that that you're sort of seeing some gems? Is it to you a a sexual thing or is it very much a company? Yeah, so for us is that we try to find opportunities in almost every sector because they exist. Um, And especially when you go into the smaller end um, where opportunity is incredible. Um, You look at the returns of the smaller smaller index compared to the large cap, um, they're phenomenal because they they exist all the growth opportunities. Um, You know, take healthcare, for example. We like healthcare, it's defensive and the like. Um, But you know what? Big, large healthcare doesn't generate that much of a growth um, at this point. Um, Brands is a, a reopening play, but we found the smaller healthcare, such as Aroa, it's a tiny little business that just listed. Um, it's very si- similar to um, Polynovo, mm-hmm. and uh, but it's trading half of its valuation. And, uh, and it's offering incredible amounts of growth uh, over the next five years. So, you know, it's story like that that will generate the extra return while at the same time you manage the risk of the portfolio. Um, but you shouldn't be shy away taking opportunity yeah. of those exciting return opportunities. So aside from obviously investing with you or watching Ausbiz, <laughs> how do investors, you know, get on board? How do they find these stories? How do they find these companies, particularly at the smaller end? You know, they're not generally covered extensively. How do you how do you know where to start looking? Look to get it's started. A job, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, it is a full time job. Look uh, for many investors, retail investors, they got ideas from reading the fi- the financial reviews and the you know the business sections of the newspaper. It does help you to build a broad knowledge of what is happening globally and what is happening on the com- company front. Um, and companies such as Aurora, for example, um, they were um, talked about in the AFR before they came listing and mm. a lot of that. So you will see more airtime given to, to those smaller businesses just given how well they performed um, you know share price doubled on listing so you know it's it's just all of that um, general knowledge of what's happening um, in the financial space and um, and then stick to the company you know you need to do research and stick to the ones you know you mentioned hot stocks and not to chase hot stocks buy now pay later what is going on in this sector? Um, you know, it's it, it, they're not just individual stocks that we're, we're seeing this growth. Some of these numbers are just crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have started to see, I think, you know, some stuff's been topping out. We've, we're starting to see some analyst downgrades, but we've seen that in the past and they've just kept on moving higher. What is your take on this sector? Are you in? Are you out? Are you long? Are you short? What What do investors need to understand? Look, uh, talk about hot stock. This is a very hot space. Um, we have been believers of buy now, pay later, or after pay, really, investor of after pay for, um, for a few years now. Um, you know, what we really saw was um, with after pay is that they clearly demonstrated um, the need and the niche that they found themselves in. Um, you know, the, the merchants that use Afterpay loves it because it changes conversion. So people will use, uh, will pay you and spend mm. and buy things. And the customer likes it because it's convenient and then push out when they pay out things. Um, and then they can use on a fr- high frequency basis. And it's not a credit product. It's not, um, you know, you have to borrow from credit card. It's different. And it's much more suited to the lifestyle of the millennials. Very skewed to the online shopping because that's where it's 
uh, with First Born. Um, and over the last few years, Afterpay has really demonstrated its ability of growing and replicate that model in US and UK now start seeing early indication and we can confidently see other similar markets should have similar sort of take up. In the US growth has been phenomenal. Um, you know, we've seen how many times analysts upgraded those numbers um, just because, um, you know, there's a need and demand for product like Afterpay. Now, um, of course, the share price has gone through the roof um, and there has flow on impact on the rest of the sector, such as the Zip and then Cezo and, you know, a whole lot of other um, areas. Our view has always been stick to the top. Uh, mm -hmm. couple of players. Um, you know, we like Zip, we like um, Afterpay. Um, Zip is slightly different, but it's a baby Afterpay that's coming through um, and, uh, you know, much broader product suite. Um, but look, the future is enormous. They only just penetrated 1% of the US market and now they're launching in Europe and uh, Canada and uh, UK. Um, each market could double uh, what, you know, Australian market look, uh, mm. had the, what they have done in the Australian market. So it's real. Um, and we already seen huge amount of institutional, um, you know, interest in this space. You know, we saw the Silicon Valley private equity, um, you know, bought into Zip. We saw Tencent, which is a large tech giant um, out of Asia, uh, took stake in Afterpay. Um, and so this area is hot, and it has taken the um, taken the spotlight, um, you know, from some of those tech mm. names around the world. So uh, it's a real space, but of course, competition is heating up. Yeah. So you're currently seeing a bit of share price coming back because uh, PayPal has launched a similar sort of product. So, uh, so as many other similar credit providers providing similar sort of space. So um, there is competition, but our view is that number one, top couple of players, they will do well consistently. Just watch those subscriber numbers. It is though something like a PayPal, you know, there's, there's, there's Afterpay and, and there's so many others kind of in that space, but then you do get a behemoth, you know, like PayPal with that brand already kind of everywhere come in and say, actually, no, we're going to do this now. Um, is that a is that a real risk, or is there? I guess will the pie continue to grow um, so that's so big that there's there's plenty of room for everybody to be profitable? Look, I actually think this reminds me so much of the um, the banking sector, for example. You know, um, you know, banking sectors, banks are everywhere. They're offering every financial product services. Um, you know, at the early stage of the fintech uh, rise of fintech in Australia, we always fearful. What if the bank decide to go this area and your entire business model will fall apart? But the banks just can't concentrate because they have so many of their problems and so much of the old. Um, the traditional revenue at stake for them to focus on, then to you know uh, uh, focus on some of the those areas where it doesn't make any difference to their overall earnings. So mm -hmm. traditional asset owners or the PayPal's and the like, which has been a bit behind in this payment space. Um, Generally, um, the experience, historical experience has been that they, they tend not to be able to catch up as much of the flow just because the market leaders are already there, grab the land, grab the space um, and represented their brand. Afterpay is now running Afterpay Day, um, you know, and uh, that's power. Um, and Afterpay Day has generated significant amount of sales for its retailers. So it's all about the value you deliver yeah. back to the retailers. And if you can cons consistently doing that, then you justify your existence in the ecosystem. Okay. You've talked about how you're sort of quite comfortable, I guess, with where the markets are at the moment, these sort of record high mm. levels, despite what we're seeing, you know, in, in the global economy. What are some of the, what would change your mind, I guess? What would make you a little more cautious or a little more nervous? What sort of indicators and stats data that may, may start to come out? I mean, we get data all the time. Um, you know, payrolls, unemployment numbers, all of these are absolutely woeful um, and yet the markets still keep going higher. What would it take for you to think actually there's going to be a fundamental shift here and perhaps that weight of money won't be enough to, to, to keep markets where they are? Look, um, uh, the reason market continue to go higher is with the expectations things will get better. Um, and because we have seen the, um, the early indications of how things are getting better and the amount of money, cheap money that's around the world inflating that asset prices. Now, what's going to change that is, um, you know, one thing is it could be that vaccine could be a long, long time away. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, you know, we won't have any positive data out of those vaccines. And at the same time, the second wave has become far worse than expected. That would definitely dent the confidence of the equity market of what it might look like. Um, however, um, that at this point we're putting as a sort of more um, 
extreme example, yeah. more bearish sort of assumption. The normal base cases assumption is really, look, vaccine announcement will probably come later this year. Um, you know, whether they'll be available probably will take six months, 12 months. Mm. Um, but that's the expectation. And also, we just on the path to recovery, which we have seen, you know, things will get better um, gradually. Um, not a, you know, sharp recovery, but it will slowly get better. But remember, what that means is that we will finally end the earnings recession because we have had earnings downgrade for so long. Um, you know, every year you just see analysts downgrading earnings expectations and outlook. But from here on, um, thanks to all the significant earnings cuts, earnings will actually grow from mm -hmm. here on off a lower base. Um, so over the next two years, you will actually see earnings being upgraded for a lot of those sectors. Um, and what that means is that share price will follow higher for those sectors. Clearly, we'll be changing leadership what sector will outperform, but you will see the market grind yeah. higher. Um, you mentioned Ramsey, for, uh, for an example, you know, a big, very well-known Australian company in, in the healthcare space. Um, what other kind of, I guess, subsectors in healthcare or, or company specifics? I don't want you to have to share any of your <laughs> secrets, but what are you really looking at in that space at the moment? What excites you? Look, I think healthcare sector normally is, um, you know, when you think about it, it's not an exciting sector, but it's it's been a growth sector and it's been a quality sector. So um, it's been extremely defensive during the sell-off um, and um, in, even in the normal years, it's been delivering good growth compared to, you know, the banks and the others. So very defensive, very good sector. Now, what we're seeing at the moment is that there's a value end, which is actually the Ramsey Healthcare. It's a value, cheap value end, and it offers good earnings uplift over the next two years when things ramp up. So that's a really good space. Um, CSL actually is looking Big being the largest stock in the market, um, it is actually looking a little bit um, uh, softer in terms of outlook just because of disruption mm -hmm. from uh, plasma collection and the like. Um, but what get we also excited is when you're going down the smaller end, Aroa is this little biotech that got, get us a little bit excited. Um, small position for us, but you know it will deliver really good growth um, and it's very cheap compared to the likes of Polynovo and um, mm -hmm. other biotech that's listed. Uh, June Bay, final question. Uh, two, three, five years from now, put yourself there and, and, and look back for me. Um, obviously, we still don't know what's to come, but fingers crossed it can't be any worse or more crazy than what we've seen in the last 12 months. What do you think will be some of the big lessons um, that we've learned in, in, in terms of, of markets when you look back? I think the big lessons that we will we would be by then um, kicking ourselves for not buying more stuff, <laughs> um, because you know um, when we talk to some of those premium assets, the Transurban, the um, you know Ramsey or Sydney Airports, you know Centre Group, um, you know this is the ones in the lifetime or well, mm. decade buying opportunity. March was great, um, but there was too much fear and everything around. But now still looks very reasonable, um, and these are the assets they non-replaceable, um, a lot of those assets. So that's one thing we'll look back and thinking, well, we should have bought those um, those assets. Um, and I think another thing going, you know, by the time we get there, we will be looking at some of the, um, you know, things that's currently happening in the background, but the equity market cho chooses to overlook. Mm -hmm. um, things like the, you know, political tension, geopolitical tension that's happening, Australia, China, US, and, you know, around the world. Now. It is our view that um, eventually we will have this sort of decoupling taking place. Um, perhaps 10 years, perhaps 20. Um, we don't know how long it will take, but gradually it will take place just because it to rising power um, and, um, you know, globally and, um, you know, there will be a bit of tension. Now, it's an opportunity in terms of investment. Now, which company will play to that? Um, uh, because it's not all fear. And, you know, when you think about it, when you have decoupling, you have two sets of technology platform, you have two sets of everything, uh, which is great. And uh, so, but how do we take advantage of it? Um, and I'm sure there are, um, you know, traps and things that we need to avoid, um, you know, and by then, hopefully it will be clearer, um, you know, which sector might perform and, you know, or even new sectors that might rise um, from this um, event. Great. Junbei, thank you. Thank you very much. Great to talk.